one grand moment I could hear the angels bending near. Seated one day at the piano, I was weary and ill at ease, and my fingers wandered idly over the noisy keys. I know not what I was playing or what I was dreaming. on the line of the Southern Pacific. A reporter would have called it a mushroom town, but it was not. Paloma was first and last of the toadstool variety. The train stopped there at noon for the engine to drink and for the passengers both to drink and to dine. There was a new yellow pine hotel, also a wool warehouse, and perhaps three dozen box residences. The rest was composed of tents, cow ponies, black waxy mud, and mesquite trees, all bound round by horizon. Paloma was an about-to-be city. The houses represented faith, the tents, hope, the twice-a-day train by which you might leave, credibly sustained the role of charity. 
The Parisian restaurant occupied the muddiest spot in the town while it rained, and the warmest when it shone. It was operated, owned, and perpetrated by a citizen known as Old Man Hinkle, who had come out of Indiana to make his fortune in this land of condensed milk and sorghum. Eileen was the daughter of the house, and the first lady cashier to invade the territory south of an east and west line drawn through Galveston and Del Rio. She sat on a high stool in a rough pine grandstand under the shelter at the door of the kitchen. There was barbed wire protection in front of her, with a little arch under which you passed your money. Heaven knows why the barbed wire, for every man who dined Parisianly there would have died in her service. Her duties were light. Each meal was a dollar. You put it under the arch and she took it. The Parisian restaurant was within a radius. Even from beyond its circumference, men rode into Paloma to win her smiles. They got them. One meal, one smile, one dollar. But with all her impartiality, Eileen seemed to favor three of her admirers above the rest. <laughs> seated at the parlor piano, entertaining her three favorite suitors with her rendition of Sweet Violence. Suitor number one, Lincoln Ulysses Harris, had never been cut to any particular pattern. He had been a mule driver, cowboy, ranger, soldier, prospector, and cattleman. He follows where his whim or interest wills him. And currently, his favorite whim and favorite interest is the wooing of Miss Eileen Hinkle. Suitor number two, Brian Jacks, had known every city from Bangor to San Francisco and had mastered every art, trade, game, business, and sport in the world and was wont to tell you all about it when he was not otherwise speaking patronizingly and disrespectfully of Broadway, Beacon Hill, Michigan, Euclid, Fifth Avenue, and the St. Louis Four Courts. Suda number three, Bud Cunningham, had been engaged at a nearby ranch to assist in compelling refractory cattle to keep within the bounds of decorum and order. Bud was the only cowboy off the stage who looked like one on it. He wore the sombrero, the chaps, and the handkerchief tied at the back of his neck. Well, that's mighty fine. Rosewood. And what a sweet tone. Your new piano. It is certainly quite the instrument. Old Man Hinkle enters with a tray of coffee and saucers. It certainly is. Cost me an arm and a leg, too, figuratively speaking. I got it. Eileen, why don't you tell them that interesting story about Rush Kinney and the Adams clan? Rush Kinney is the gentleman I obtained the piano from. Rambler had stopped overnight at the sheep ranch of Rush Kenny on the sandy fork of the Nueces. The two men had been strangers up to the time the traveler had called hello at his hitchin rack, but from that moment until the morning, they became, as per the code in Texas, undeniable friends. As the men exchanged pleasantries out on the porch that evening, there burst forth a volume of sudden and brilliant music. Construer of that rollicking fantasia has credibly mastered the secrets of the keyboard. 
You don't often hear as agreeable a noise as that on a sheep ranch. A piano, and one so well played, is just about the last thing I expected to hear emanating from your ranch house. Well, I never see any reason for not playing up to the arts and graces, just, just because we happen to live out on a brush. It's, it's a lonesome life for a woman. And if a little music can make it better, well, why not have it? <laughs> a wise and generous theory. Wow, Mrs. Kinney plays well. She has technique and more than ordinary power. Say, you, you come up the trail from the Double Elm Fork, didn't you? I did. Yeah, well, that's, that's where all this music proposition all got started. That's near where old Cal Adams lived. <laughs> Cal Adams. He had about 800 graded merinos and a daughter that was solid silk. She was as handsome as a new steak rope on a $30 pony. <laughs> Miss Marilla was her name, and, and I had it figured out by the rule of two that she was destined to become the Chatelaine and Lady Superior of Rancho Lomito, belonging to R. Kinney Esquire, where you are now a welcome and honored guest. Now, you never saw anybody in your life that was as full of knowledge, yet had less sense that old cow, <laughs> he was advised about all branches of information contained in learning. And he was up to all the rudiments of doctrines and enlightenment. You couldn't advance him any ideas on any parts of speech or lines of thought. You, you, you would have thought he was a professor of the weather and politics and chemistry and natural history and, and origins of derivations. <laughs> One day, just after the fall shearing, I rides over to the Double Elm with a ladies' magazine about fashions for Marilla and, and a scientific paper for old Cal. Now, while I was tying my pony to a mesquite, out runs Marilla, tickled to death with some news that just couldn't wait. Oh, Rush, Dad's gonna buy me a piano. Ain't it grand? <laughs> well, that's mighty good of Uncle Cal to do that. Now, for my part, I, I shouldn't like anything better than to ride home of an evening and listen to a few waltzes and jigs with somebody, somebody about your size sitting on the piano stool and rounding up the notes. Oh, hush about that. And go in the house. Dad hasn't rode out today. He's not feeling well. Well, old Cal was inside lying on a cot, and he had a pretty bad cold and a, and a cough, and so I stayed to supper. So you, you're going to get Marilla a piano, I hear. <coughs> She's been hankering for music for a long spell. I'll allow to fix her up with something in that line right away. I'm going to San Antonio, select an instrument for her myself. Well, w wouldn't it be better to take Marilla along and let her pick out the one that she likes? I might have known that that would set Uncle Cal a-going. A man like him that knew everything about everything, <laughs> he would look at that as a reflection on his attainments. No, sir, it wouldn't. There ain't a better judge of musical instruments in the whole world than what I am. I had an uncle that was a partner in a piano factory, and I've seen thousands of them put together. There ain't a man lives, sir, that can tell me any news about any instrument that has to be pounded, blowed, scraped, grinded, picked, or wound with a key. Well, it wasn't long after, one evening about sundown, when Cal came a-rolling up in the wagon. And there in his wagon, wrapped up in wool sacks, was his bounty from San Antone. Out runs Marilla, her eyes a-shining and her hair a-flying. Dad, have you bought it? Finest piano in San Antone. Genuine rosewood and the finest, loudest tone you ever listened to. I heard the storekeeper play it and I took it on the spot. Later that evening, Uncle Cal flops over and complains of his lungs. He has a high fever and has to be helped into bed by Marilla. When I come in from the pasture, 
Marilla was in the room where the piano was, and I, I caught a glimpse of her as she puts both arms around the piano and hugs it with a kind of a smile, like you see kids doing with their Christmas toys. Now, I could see by the strings and the wool sacks on the floor that she had, she had unwrapped it, but now she was tying the wagon sheet back over it again, and there was a kind of a, a, kind of a solemn, whitish look on her face. Ain't wrapping up the music again, are you, Marilla? I asked her. What's the matter with just a couple of tunes for just to see how she goes out under the saddle? Not tonight, Rush. I don't think Uncle Cal is too sick to hear a little agitation on the piano keys of just, just to christen the machine. But it seems Uncle Cal was plenty sick after all. He took a turn for the worse and Rush had to saddle up and ride over to Bird's Tail to summon Doc Simpson. Well, when Doc Simpson comes over, he tells us that Uncle Cal has pneumonia. And as the old man was past 60 and nearly on the lift, anyhow, the odds was against him walking on grass anymore. So imagine our surprise when he joined Marilla and me on the pantry that following evening. <coughs> Did you look at your instrument, honey? It's lovely, Dad. And do you like it? I never saw one so pretty. How good and dear it was of you to buy it for me. <coughs> I haven't heard you play on it any yet, and I've been listening. My side don't hurt quite so bad now. Won't you play a piece, Marilla? But no, no, she puts Uncle Cal off and soothes him down like you've seen women do with a kid. It seems she's made up her mind not to touch that piano just at present. On the fourth day of his sickness, he calls for Marilla again and wants to talk piano. I got the finest instrument for the money in San Antonio. Ain't that piano all right in every respect, Marilla? It's just perfect, Dad. But don't you think you could sleep a little while just now? <coughs> no, I don't. I don't believe you've even tried it yet. I went all the way to San Antonio and picked it out for you myself. Won't you play a little bit for me, Marilla? <coughs> yeah, well, why not hit out a tune or two with the soft pedal on, Marilla? It, it would please him a great deal to hear you touch up the piano he's bought for you. But Marilla stands there with big tears rolling down from her eyes and says nothing. Then she runs over and slips her arm under Uncle Cal's neck and hugs him tight. One well, last night, I played it ever so much, honest. It's such a splendid instrument. You don't know how I love it. Last night, I played Bonnie Dundee. At the Anvil Polka. And the Blue Danube. play so loud when you were so sick. Well, maybe I did. Maybe I did and forgot about it. My head is a little cranky at times. I'm mighty glad you like it, Marilla. Yes, I believe I could go to sleep a while if you'll stay right beside me till I do. Well, there was where Marilla had me a guessing. Much as she thought of that old man, she wouldn't strike a note on that piano that he'd bought her. I could not imagine why she told him that she'd been playing it for the wagon sheet hadn't been ever been taken off since she put it back on that same day it come. Now, I knew she could play a little anyhow, for I'd once heard her snatch some pretty fair dance music out of an old piano at the Charcoal Logger Ranch. Well, in about a week... That pneumonia got the best of Uncle Cal. Had the funeral over at Bird's Tail, and that evening I brought Marilla back to her house in my buckboard. And that night, Marilla takes me into the room where the piano is. Come here, Rush. I want you to see this now. Well, she unties the rope, and she drags off the wagon sheet. Now, <laughs> if you ever rode a saddle 
without a horse, or if you ever fired off a gun that wasn't loaded, or if you ever took a drink out of an empty bottle, why, then you might have been able to scare an opera or two out of that instrument that Uncle Cal had bought. <laughs> Instead of a piano, it was one of the machines they've invented to play the piano with. A self-playing piano. By itself, it was about as musical as the holes of a flute. Without the flute. And that... That was the piano that Uncle Cal had selected. And standing by it was the good, fine, all-wool girl that never let him know it. Now, what you heard a playing a while ago up there at the house, well, that was that same deputy piano machine, only, only just at present, it's shoved up against a $600 piano that I bought for Marilla as soon as we was married. <laughs> Eileen smiles and looks expectantly at her suitors for their reaction. Well, gentlemen, how does the story strike you? It came over my ear like the sweet sound that breathes upon a bank of violets, stealing and giving odor. Yeah, it sounded fantastical. Music to one's ear. And if music be the food of love, play on. I rather liked it. Don't you think Shakespeare was a great writer? Having myself recently been in Chicago, in the parlance of the straight and to the point Chicagoan, I would say he certainly had a way with words. Don't you think Bostonians are more cultured than their second city counterparts? Oh, who, who am I to pit one against the other? Suffice it to say that Shakespeare could paint quite the picture. I've always held that Rosa Bonheur is the greatest of the female painters. Well, I've got my cheese for hoity toity Easterners. I must concede that Westerners are the more spontaneous and more open-hearted souls. I do appreciate, Miss Eileen, that your expressed opinions indicate keeping up with the world's best thought. Yeah, you silver-tongued devil, you. You know Miss Eileen thinks of oral adulation. I detest flattery. Frankness and honesty of speech are the mental ornaments of men and women. If ever I could like anyone, it would be for those qualities. It gets awfully weary having compliments paid on my looks to me. I know I am not beautiful. Mr. Cunningham told Mr. Harris afterward it was all he could do to keep from calling her a liar when she said that. I'm only a little Middle Western girl who just wants to be simple and neat and tries to help her father make a humble living. The Parisian restaurant allowed old man Hinkle to ship in excess of a thousand silver dollars a month, clear profit, to a bank in San Antonio. Mr. Cunningham did not know whether Eileen wanted what she said she wanted or what she deserved. Many a wiser man has hesitated at deciding. Bud decided. Miss Eileen, beauty as you might say ain't everything. I was admired more than anything else about you, the nice, kind way you treat your pa. Anyone that's good to their parents and is a kind of homebody don't especially need to be too pretty. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. I consider that one of the finest compliments I've had in a long time. I'd so much rather hear you say that to he than to hear you talk about my eyes or my hair. I'm glad you believe me when I say I don't like flattery. Sure thing, Miss Eileen. The good lookers don't always win out. Why, I knew a go girl once in Dubuque with a face like a coconut who could skin the cat twice on a horizontal bar without changing hands. Now, 
A girl might have the California peach crop mashed to a marmalade and not be able to do that. I've seen uh, worse lookers than you, Miss Eileen. But what I like about you is the business way you've got of doing things. Cool and wise. That's the winning way for a girl. Why, Mr. Hinkle told me the other day you'd never taken in a lead silver dollar or plugged one since you've been on the job. Now that's the stuff for a girl. That's what catches me. Thank you, Mr. Jax. If you only knew how I appreciate anyone's being candid and not a flatterer, I get so tired of people telling me I'm pretty. I think it is the loveliest thing to have friends who tell you the truth. Mr. Harris thought he saw an expectant look on Eileen's face as she glanced his way and had a wild, sudden impulse to dare fate and tell her of all the beautiful handiwork of the great artificer, she was the most exquisite. That she was a flawless pearl, gleaming pure and serene in a setting of black mud and emerald prairies. That she was a corker. And as for his, he cared not if she were as cruel as a serpent's tooth to her father, or if she couldn't tell a plug dollar from a bridle buckle. If he might sing, chant, Praise, glorify, and worship her peerless and wonderful beauty. But I refrained. I feared the fate of a flatterer. I had witnessed her delight at the crafty and discreet words of Bud and Jacks. <laughs> no, no, Miss Hinkle was not one to be beguiled by the plated silver tongue of a flatterer. So I joined the ranks of the candid and honest. At once, I became mendacious and didactic. In all ages, Miss Hinkle, in spite of the poetry and romance of each, intellect in women has been admired more than beauty. Even in Cleopatra herself, men found more charm in her queenly mind than in, in her looks. Well, I should think so. I've seen pictures of her that weren't so much. She had an awfully long nose. Well, if I may say so, you remind me of Cleopatra, Miss Eileen. My nose isn't so long. Oh, oh, oh well, I, I, I mean, I mean, as to, as to mental endowments. Oh, oh, thank you, every one of you for being so frank and honest with me. That's the way I want you to be always. Just tell me plainfully and truthfully what you think and we'll all be the best friends in the world. And now, because you've all been so good to me and understand so well how I dislike people who do nothing but pay me exaggerated compliments, I'll sing and play a little for you. Well, of course, we expressed our thanks and joy, but we would have been better pleased if Eileen had remained in her low rocking chair face to face with us and let us gaze upon her. For she was no Adelina Patty, not even on the farewellest to the Divas Farewell Tours. She had a cooing little voice like that of a turtle dove that could almost fill the parlor when the windows and doors were closed and the cook was not rattling the lids of the stove in the kitchen. Eileen had a gamut that I estimate about um, eight inches on the piano. <laughs> and her runs and trills sounded like the clothes bubbling in your grandmother's iron wash pot. <laughs> Eileen's musical taste was Catholic. <laughs> she would sing through a pile of sheet music on the left hand top of the piano, laying each slaughtered composition over onto the right hand top. <laughs> the next evening, she would sing from right to left. Her favorites were Mendelssohn, Moody, and Sankey. Believe me that she must have been beautiful when I tell you it sounded like music to us.
When the three suitors were not being entertained by Eileen in the Hinkle parlor, they often met at the little wooden train station where Mr. Jax was employed and sat on the platform swinging their feet and trying to pump one another for clues as to which way Miss Eileen's inclination seemed to lean. That is the way of rivals. They do not avoid and glower at one another. They converse and construe, striving by the art of politic to estimate the strength of the enemy. I have always maintained and, and asserted from time to time that woman is no mystery. That man can foretell, construe, subdue, comprehend, and interpret her. That she is a mystery has been foisted by herself upon credulous mankind. It seems to me that words are wasted in effort to describe Miss Eileen's beauty. But that voice. <laughs> voice. <laughs> voice. 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 One day, there came a dark horse to the courting of Miss Eileen Hinkle. C. Vincent Vesey, a recent graduate of a Southwestern law school. A compound of Daniel Webster, Lord Chesterfield, Beau Brummel, and Little Jack Horner, Mr. Vesey soon came to be a formidable visitor in the Hinkle parlor. His competition reduced Bud to an inspired increase in profanity, drove Jax to an outburst of slang so weird that it sounded more horrible than the most trenchant of Bud's imprecations and left Mr. Harris dumb with gloom. For Vessie had the rhetoric. Words flowed from him like oil from a gusher. Hyperbole, compliment, praise, appreciation, honeyed gallantry, golden opinions, eulogy, and unveiled panegyric vied with one another for preeminence in his speech. The other three had small hopes that Eileen could resist his oratory and Prince Albert. One dusk evening, Mr. Harris was sitting on the little gallery in front of the Hinkle parlor, waiting for Eileen to come, when he heard voices inside. Eileen? Your young fellers have been calling to see you regular for quite a while. Is there any one of them you like better than another? Why, Paul, I like them all very well. I think Mr. Cunningham and Mr. Jacks and Mr. Harris are very nice young men. I haven't known Mr. Vesey very long, but like the others, he's very nice. They are all so frank and honest in everything they say to me. That's what I'm getting at. You're always saying you like people that tell the truth and don't go humbugging you with compliments and bogus talk. Now, suppose you make a test of these fellers and see which one of them will talk the straightest to you. How will I do it? You sing a little bit, Eileen, and you took music lessons nearly two years in Logansport. It wasn't long, but it was all we could afford then. And your teacher said you didn't have any voice, and it was a waste of money to keep on. Now, suppose you ask the fellers what they think of your singing, and see what each one of them tells you. The man that'll tell you the truth about it will have a mighty lot of nerve, and will do to tie to. What do you think of the plan? Later that evening, Mr. Harris was at the train station telling Mr. Jackson and Mr. Cunningham what he had overheard. I am smitten with the deliciousness of it, fellas. Surely this test will eliminate Vessie from the contest. <laughs> with his unctuous flattery, he's sure to be driven from the lists. <laughs> I mean, his love of frankness and honesty will be his undoing. Lincoln Arms the sometimes rivals did a grotesque dance of joy up and down the platform. 
So come with me, and I will treat you decent. I will sit you down, and I will fill your pan. And along the street, all the friends I meet say that Rose is a he's a solid man. Four of the willow rocking chairs in the Hinkle parlor were filled, besides the lucky one that sustained Miss Hinkle. Three awaited with suppressed excitement the application of the test. It was tried on Bud first. Mr. Cunningham, what do you think of my voice? Frankly and honestly, as you know, I want you always to be toward me. Bud squirmed in his chair at his chance to show the sincerity that he knew was required of him. Tell you the truth, Miss Eileen, you, you ain't got much more voice than a weasel. Just a little squeak, you know. And of course, we all like to hear you sing, for it's kind of sweet and soothing after all, but as for real singing, uh, I reckon you couldn't call it that. Mr. Jackson and Mr. Harris looked closely at Eileen to see if Mr. Cunningham had overdone his frankness, but Eileen's pleased smile assured them they were on the right track. And what do you think, Mr. Jax? Take it from me, you ain't in the prima donna class. I've heard him warble in every city in the United States, and I tell you, your vocal output don't go. Otherwise, you've got the Grand Opera Bunch sent to the soap factory, in looks, I mean. For the high screechers generally look like Mary Ann on her Thursday out. But Nick's for the gargle work. Your epiglottis ain't a real sidestepper. Its footwork ain't, it ain't good. With a merry laugh at Mr. Jack's criticism, Eileen turned an inquiring eye to Mr. Harris. I, I admit I faltered a little. Was there not such a thing as being too frank? Perhaps I even hedged a little in my verdict. But I stayed with the critics. Miss Eileen, I'm not skilled in scientific music, but, but frankly, I, I cannot praise very highly the singing voice that nature has given you. It has long been a favorite comparison that a great singer sings like a bird. Well, there are birds and there are birds. <laughs> uh, I would say your voice reminds me of um, the thrushes, throaty and not strong, nor of much compass or variety, but still uh, in her, uh, sweet in, her, uh, in its way. Thank I, you, I, I... Mr. Harris. I knew I could depend on your frankness and honesty. C. Vincent Vesey drew back one sleeve from his cuff and the dam of his adulation burst. To be in the presence of such a priceless God-given treasure, the voice of Miss Eileen Hinkle, tis if the angels in heaven had gathered round to praise the morning stars in choral affirmation. The celebrated grand opera stars from Jenny Lynn to Emma Albert are but a timid ensemble of tepid voices compared to your oral endowments. You have by far the most effervescent and effluent of all larynxes. <sighs> Those divine chest notes. The nuances in your phrasing are so marvelously understated. And those artful arpeggios and tremendous treble trills. Alliterative, absolutely alliteratively alluring. Though certainly her equal in beauty and charm, it might be said that you might not reach a note or two in the upper ranges of Geraldine Farrar's register, but that is merely due to the lack of practice and formal training. There are in many prestigious Illimacenary institutions any number of capable and willing mentors and teachers who would trip over one another for the opportunity to assist you 
in developing your singular vocal gifts that have heretofore been sequestered in the confines of this humble parlor. I see a great future ahead for the coming star of the Southwest, and one of which all Texans may well be proud. When music historians look back- And so forth, and so on. When we left at 10, Eileen gave each of us her usual cordial handshake, entrancing smile, and an invitation to call again. I could not see that one was favored above or below another, but the three of us knew. <laughs> we knew. <laughs> we knew that frankness and honesty had won, and that the rivals numbered three instead of four. A few days went by without anything happening worthy of recount. But the next evening, Mr. Harris and Mr. Jack sought Eileen in the parlor. She was not to be found. Mr. Cunningham came into the parlor and saw his rival's similar looks of perplexity. She's not in the restaurant either. Where could she be? The three exited the parlor to search for Eileen and were met with Paul Hinkle coming out of the kitchen with two cups of hot coffee in his hands. Where's, Where's Eileen? Eileen? Where's Eileen? Where's Eileen? Well, gents, it was a sudden notion she took, but I've got the money and I let her have her way. She's gone to a corn, a conservatory in Boston for four years for to have her voice cultivated. Now, excuse me to pass, gents, for this coffee's hot and my thumbs is tender. That evening, there were four instead of three sitting on the station platform swinging their feet. C. Vincent Vesey was amongst the three original suitors, and the foursome discussed much while the dogs barked at the moon that rose as big as a five-cent piece or a flower barrel over the chaparral. We discussed whether it's better to lie to a woman or to tell her the truth. And as all of us were young then, we did not come to a decision. Home, home on the range, where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discouraging word. And the sky is not cloudy all day. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo, where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discouraging word. Light from the glittering stream. 